Good afternoon. My name is Lewis Powell. It's my pleasure to be with one of the superstars, the young superstars that we have coming up to the Cook County Bar Association, a civil rights lawyer, a, a criminal lawyer, or just a, just a good community activist. Ken Lambert. Hi, how you Brother, doing? Brother, good to see you. It's good to see you. Thank you so much for having me. some good things. Thank you. Thank Ladies you. and gentlemen, this is the topic of the day. We're going to call this show The Verdict. And I think everybody, unless you've been living under a rock, know what we're talking about. Is that right, Brother Lambert? <laughs> yeah, yeah, listen. I, I'm and Terry Lambert, there, there's a lot going on. You know, you, you're a high-profile attorney. How long have you been practicing? Uh, 22 years now. You know, Brother yeah. Lambert, you know, you've been out there longer than I thought. So you're, you're a veteran, <laughs> but, but still, you've had some high-profile cases. One of them is the Sandra Bland case. That case was in yeah. Texas, right? Right. Where the young lady, unfortunately, was found hung yeah. in a cell. You know, you, you know, you got a good... Good result for them, and you know, a lot of times, you know, ladies and gentlemen, you need a top quality attorney not only just to try the case but to settle the case. Is that right? Well, it, it's important, right? You have to always be prepared for the idea that you're going to have to try a case, but at the same time, you want to do everything you can to bring the best result uh, to a family, and sometimes that does include the possibility of settling the case too. Absolutely, because if you, if you can't try the case, attorney Lambert, what? They're yeah. not going to settle with That's you. That's right. That's They're right. not going to settle with yeah. you. They'll, they'll yeah. sense that we say weakness in the belly, yeah. as we say in the business. Yeah. So you got to be prepared to get it on. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I will be shocked if we do not get any calls. This is an interactive show. We're talking about the Van Dyke verdict. Mm -hmm. And the number to call us is 312-738-1060. 312-738-1060. Let's, let's ease into it. A little background of the case to the extent that you can. Well, I think that the background is pretty well known. Um, unfortunately, you had a young man who may have had some uh, some issues of concern that had drawn some police attention uh, to himself, but at the same time was posing no threat uh, to the police officers who had responded to the call. We know that because uh, he was walking away from them at the time that he got shot. Um, you know, and at the end of the day, the real question in, that surrounded this whole situation was whether or not Officer Van Dyke acted uh, appropriately or instead uh, acted in a way that was willful and wanton in nature. And I think it's, um, you know, you're hard pressed mm -hmm. to look at the video, which we've all seen, uh, and come to a conclusion that there was some way to justify uh, Van Dyke's conduct. And I think, frankly, uh, that verdict underscores the reality that there is no way to do so. Absolutely. Terry Lambert, let's, 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 let's give them the layman's uh, viewpoint of it. You brought up probable cause. What is probable cause? So when you think about probable cause, um, the real truth of the matter is, is that it's just a, it's a reasonable articulable suspicion. It's a, it's a question of whether or not there's a reasonable basis on which a police officer can, uh, can believe that uh, it's appropriate for them to stop you. Um, and, and that's a decision that ultimately gets made not on the street or in the field. It gets made uh, in court. Uh, by a judge at a probable cause hearing. So the, the thing to take away from that is is that even though you and I might not agree mm -hmm. that there's probable cause and an officer might believe that there is, the real decision won't be made by the officer or by a lawyer or by the person who is the subject of a stop. It will be made by a judge later on down the road. So it's really a situation where uh, in, 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 in Laquan's uh, circumstances, uh, there, there was already engaged police activity, and Laquan was already the subject of that conduct, that activity. Um, and we know that prior to Van Dyke getting there, there had not been an effort to try and physically um, accost him. Uh, Correct. There were already police officers that were on the scene who were observing the situation and assessing it to determine how best to address it. The problem with Van Dyke was that when he got to the scene, rather than speaking to any of the individuals that were there that had more information about the situation. Instead of assessing the situation for himself, he reacted immediately and in fact did so in an egregious way. Absolutely. Attorney Lambert, because you know, you, you know, you're on the national front, make no mistake, because the Sandra Black case, you were already out there, give me, don't get me wrong, mm. but the Sandra Black case put you on a higher level. Is it fair to say? Well, so I, the way I look at it is this. Anytime a family gives you the opportunity mm -hmm. to represent them, it's really a blessing. You're not entitled uh, to try and help anybody or to participate in their 
circumstances when people invite you into their sorrow, invite you into their uh, their difficulty. It's it's really a blessing and it's really a responsibility that you ha you can't take lightly. Absolutely. Um, I've I've been fortunate uh, to have had other cases that have, for lack of a better term, uh, been relatively high profile. Um, and a few that have had national attention. Mm -hmm. Sandra Bland's situation was one that kind of, uh, it enveloped the whole national scene. Uh, and and, and you're, you're probably aware there's a, an HBO special that will be featured on uh, December 3rd. Uh, that will, it's a documentary that was done on, on the case. Uh, and the Chicago Film Festival uh, is going to be featuring that as well. Um, it was a it was a it was a, a really horrible, unfortunate situation, and one that I think that uh, really kind of captured um, uh, everybody in the Chicago land area and across the nation, frankly. Well, you you're on the upper level, my brother. I, I, I don't know. I don't know that. You're on the next level. <laughs> I'm, Trust I'm, me. You're, I'm, on the, you're on the next level. You humble well, me. Thank you for but, that. You know, but you know, I, I'm serious because you know, to take a case like that. And handling the way that you did, you know, you know, kudos to you as we say in the you. business. Thank now, in, in terms of, you know, Black Lives Matter, all we have all of this spinning around. We have Black Lives Matter. We have Blue Lines, Blue Lives Matter, correct? You, you have all of this going back and forth, going back and forth. What do you see as a balance in terms of the people versus the police taking account that sometimes policemen have to make a quick decision? In, in real time as opposed to, you know, Monday morning quarterback saying, you know, I could have did this, I could have done that. Do you have an opinion on that? So I do. And I, I almost think you step back for a minute. If mm -hmm. you look at it from this standpoint, first of all, Black Lives Matter, um, it, you know, it's, it's the fact that we have to announce that is a shame. Okay. Um, but if you think historically about how what we often have mm -hmm. to do because our, our communities are, 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 are not treated appropriately um, and then how it gets adopted by the oppressive community, it's, it's, it's sort of disappointing and shocking at the same time. Blue Lives Matter is a response to Black Lives Matter. It shouldn't be. Right, just like when we call when we talk about black power, now you get white power. I mean, you know, it's it's there's always a reactive pushback from the request that we be treated appropriately with fairness. Exactly. And and, and that shouldn't ever be. Everybody is entitled to be treated fairly. So when we talk about from the context of, of, of interacting with police and how do you balance um, you know police activity and and how do you balance the goals that the police have and the, and the goals that this that the society has and civilians in the society have that to me in a lot of ways seems to be very easy civilians us lay people us we just want to go back and forth to work we want to live our lives we don't want to have people impose uh, their will on us and we don't want problems we just want to exist comfortably correct police they want to go to job to their job they want to come home from their jobs to their families and the like we want the same things right I mean ultimately speaking we want the same things but the practical reality of it is is that we come from uh, such different perspectives in terms of our interaction um, when 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 we don't get treated appropriately and then it gets covered up when we don't get treated appropriately and then it's swept under the rug when we don't get treated pro appropriately and it's lied about then it, it it sows the seeds of distrust in the community and then in turn the police feed on that distrust and then want to hold us accountable for the distrust so it's like this system that needs to be broken and the way you really break the system is you hold those people with authority accountable for that authority. You know, it we, starts at the top. It starts. It starts at the very top. Listen, when 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 we look at police work, we understand that it's a dangerous job. We understand that it's an important job, and we all want to be able to call the mm -hmm. police, right? Attorney Lambert, hold that thought. We have a caller. Caller, are you there? <laughs> caller, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Go ahead, please. I wanted to know uh, what's the difference between having a sentence consecutively or uh, I guess a conservative or consecutively or cons oh. Uh, if, if you're talking about when Van Dyke with respect to his various uh, charges, the charges that he was found guilty for, whether or not he's going to be, um, he'll be sentenced um, consecutively or concurrently. Yes, sir. Okay, yeah. So when when you're sentenced and your sentence run concurrently, what it means is they run at the same time. 
So, and, but if it's consecutively, it builds on one another. So if you get a six year sentence, six to 30 years, plus six to 30 years, plus six to 30 years, if it's consecutively, then they will all run at the same time. So it's, it's really six to, to, to 30 years. But if it's, I mean, if, if it's concurrently rather. If it's consecutively though, then it's at the same time. Right, so it's the same time if it's if it's um, concurrently. It's if it's consecutively, then it is added on. You see what I mean? So that's that's sort of the situation. You want to be in a place where, I mean, I, you know, I know a lot of people are concerned about what the sentence is is going to ultimately be, and I know that there's a lot of talk about that. It's going to be very interesting to see how that plays out. But we do know, at least my understanding is, is that. There are certain charges that he was, uh, uh, like the uh, the, the agribat, um, that there are, there are mandatory minimums. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes down to how the sentence is going to be handed down, uh, it will take into account those mandatory minimums. Terry Lambert, you know, again, we're going to you know, do the, you know, give the layman's explanation. Explain to our audience the distinction between manslaughter and murder, or first degree murder. So first degree murder, it includes the notion that there was intent, that there was immediate intent, eminent intent. Whereas manslaughter, you can engage in a homicide, but at the time that you did so, you didn't, it wasn't premeditated. You didn't premeditate the act before you engaged in it. Um, so a lot of times people will look at like a car crash, right? Involuntary manslaughter where you, you, you know, you or, or voluntary manslaughter. You 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 weren't intending on doing what you did, but the result is is that someone died, lost their life. But if I am sitting in the bushes waiting for you and 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 waiting for you to come home and then decide to try and take your life, then that speaks to a malice of forethought, which basically means I premeditated my conduct. You, you thought about it. Yeah. You thought about That's it. That's what you it, it out. You schemed and you thought about right. it. Right. But sometimes the situation that you're reacting quickly, you still may be in the wrong and it still may result in a death and I believe that's the distinction. Right. You, you, if, if two people get into an argument and then they start to fight and then someone passes, somebody dies, um, you know, that's kind of a classic second degree murder type of scenario, right? As opposed to, um, I, I don't like my cousin or whatever it is and I start to poison them over time and I've got a plan in place that I'm attempting to try and execute on. I see. Terry Lambert, in terms of, he was 16, okay, we all know, 16 shots. Mm. Tie that in to, I believe he was charged 16, with 16 uh, counts of aggregated battery, right. is, that, is that correct? Right. Could you explain that? So every time that uh, he pulled the trigger, uh, it was an aggravated battery, meaning that he used a firearm or used a weapon to assault and uh, to, to batter uh, Laquan. And so every time that he did so, it constituted an independent crime. And so therefore he was charged with each of those individual crimes as well as being charged with the, uh, the homicide. So um, the caller's question about whether or not the sentence is going to be concurrent or instead consecutive is an important one. Because if you are, let's say he's, uh, and this is all hypothetical, I have no idea, no, no uh, real basis necessarily to suggest that I know what the judge is going to do, but let's say for every aggravated battery charge, um, uh, he was assigned a four-year sentence. Well, if he gets four years times 16, he'll serve a lot longer sentence. If he gets four years and they run concurrently, he gets a much shorter sentence. You see? I see. So that's the difference. You know, thank you for the explanation. Attorney Lambert, explain to the, to the audience, again, in layman's term, the distinction of having the jury make the decision as opposed to the judge making the decision. Mm -hmm. So a, judge, a judge's role is to be an umpire, to hear and make decisions on what the law is to interpret whether or not a statute says X or Y. And in the case of Laquan, and for, for that matter, any, any jury setting, a jury listens to the facts, listens to testimony that's given, and then looks at documentation that's submitted, and then decides what facts are truthful, 
what facts are not truthful, what facts are to be relied upon, what facts are not to be relied upon, and then makes a decision, makes a, uh, comes to a verdict on those facts. And so, what, so, so the, the roles are very, very different. Right? You've got an umpire versus the players on the field. The umpire is the judge. The players on the field are the jury. They hear all of the things that get submitted in a case mm -hmm. and then make a decision. The judge makes a decision about what things the jury gets to hear, what things are to be considered, that sort of thing. How about, and, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe in various times the, ju the, uh, the individuals on the jury had questions. Mm -hmm. Could you explain to the audience how that is handled when the jury, when someone on the jury panel has a question? So, so what happens now is, is that a juror can ask certain questions. Every judge handles that differently, and it it depends also in a civil setting versus a criminal setting, right? Um, but but now jurors are able to submit questions that they have. Now some of the questions that are submitted don't get answers. Instead the response will be you've heard all of the evidence and you've make, you have to make your decision based on the evidence. That's a decision that a judge would make. Some, answer, some questions do get answered though and it's just contingent on the kind of question that get asked and it's contingent on whether or not it's appropriate for an answer to be given. Attorney Lambert, who gives the answer? So what will happen a lot of times is is that a judge will the judge will call in both of the uh, both of the, the lawyers on from both sides and then say well listen this is the question that was posed by a juror and then a discussion will be had about what the answer should be or even if there should be an answer offered the, and then ultimately a lot of times what you'll have is you'll have one side feel that an answer should be given and it should be x and one side believe that the answer should be Y, the judge will make a decision, and sometimes you do have the parties come together and agree on what the answer should be, and therefore the answer will go back in, a, in the way that the, uh, the parties agree, assuming that the judge is, um, is acquiescent to that as well. You know, Attorney Lambert, you know, as a veteran, you know, but I, you know, the average layperson does not know, there's a lot of action going on in sidebars outside of the jury in terms of just what you said, the exchange of the lawyers arguing how the question should be answered, if at all. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, the, as we say in the business, the good lawyering is out of sight. The people are not, because a lot of times the technical aspects of the trial are really won behind the scenes. Is that correct? Well, so that's very, very true. Um, I what we do as lawyers is we really have to prepare for a case and, and in many ways you you almost want to know what the case is going to look like when it goes in when I say when it goes in what I mean when you try a case you want to have an idea as to what the evidence is going to be how it's going to come in and from what witnesses it's going to come in at you want to have a sense for how you can piece together information so as to pick and paint the best picture. And so a lot of that gets done outside of the presence of and outside of the view of a jury. Some of the decisions that get made about what evidence comes in, what evidence is deemed to be hearsay, whether or not there's any sort of exception to the hearsay rule, those are types of things that get decided on outside of the presence of the jury. When there's an objection, for example, to a question that's, that's asked of a witness, you'll sometimes hear uh, an objection and then one of the parties will ask for a sidebar. All that means is, judge, listen, I don't like that question, I don't think that was an appropriate question, and I'm asking for an opportunity to tell you why outside the presence or the presence of, of a jury. The reason it's important is because a lot of times some of that discussion can taint the perspective of a juror, right? And that's one of the things you want to try and insulate a jury from. You want to give them a true and, 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 and credible view of the, the facts and the evidence so that they can make a, a quality decision. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, we can be reached at 312-738-1067. Three one two seven three eight one four zero zero. I misspoke, mm -hmm. ladies and gentlemen. I hope that you are appreciated because this brother is bringing it. He is giving you the Reader's Digest of how a trial really operates mm -hmm. because he knows what separates the women from the girls, the men from the boys is that behind the scenes, if you don't know what you're doing, 
you could lose the trial behind the scenes on technical aspects. You, you actually lose cases well before you get to the point where you get to try them in my mind, right? It's about the preparation. Um, I had a, a, one of my mentors say, you know, you have to um, load the gun before you can shoot it. Absolutely. And so you have, to, um, you have to be in a position where you've adequately done what you need to do in order to present a case. Because uh, if you don't know the rules, and if you don't have, uh, if you haven't done the homework, then you can't perform on the test. It's just that simple, you know. Uh, it's it's one thing to be able to present, uh, you know, and the way that you you share information with people is critical too. You've got to be able to relate to people, and make people feel comfortable about what it is that you're offering as a version of events. But at the same time, if you've not done the homework, you you just can't perform on the test. A absolutely, absolutely. Attorney Lambert, what's next? Okay, the, you know, the burgers come down, what is next? So now it's, it's really a situation where there's going to be sentencing. I did, I did hear that uh, Van Dyke's lawyers are talking about they want to appeal it. Uh, and there's a whole system in place that allows for that. Uh, and we'll see whether or not that's what they end up doing. They may be looking to use that threat as a way to try and help um, uh, sort of craft what the sentencing, the sentencing suggestions will be. Uh, by the state, mm -hmm. uh, or they may have every intention of going about appeal. Um, you know, it's just a matter of, of, of what their, their decisions are. Um, and, and it could be that, uh, you know, mistrial motions could be filed and so forth and so on. I don't know whether or not that's the case currently or not. But uh, ultimately speaking, that, that's what's next. You'll, you'll see uh, some of that and then ultimately sentencing will take place. And I know a lot of people are waiting for that mm -hmm. with, a, with bated breath. Yeah. And Attorney Lambert, the prosecutors are not through because there's some other folks out there yeah. that they're, they're about to go to K trials. Is that correct? Yeah, and so I think in a lot of ways, the the, the officers that are going to be tried for uh, for sitting back and, and not doing anything or, or misrepresenting along with what took place, uh, that's the point of critical mass. That's how you change culture. When, when people around a bad actor know that they are not going to be uh, given an out for failing to report or failing to stand up, that's when people begin to understand they have responsibilities that they must come through on. And if you let those bystanders go, if you let those who misrepresented what happened out there get away, then what you're doing is you're helping to perpetuate a system that I think so many of us want to see changed. Absolutely. Attorney Lambert, we have uh, approximately one minute. Mm. If you can be so kind as to wrap it up with your perspective in terms of where do we go from here in terms of the community? So I, I really think that, you know, this is a great city, and I think we all know that in many, many ways. But I think a lot of what happened is, is predicated on and, and really because of the vigilance of our citizenry. And I would say where we go from here is we continue to watch those who are uh, public servants and we continue to hold them accountable. That's so much of what uh, kind of led to this. And we know that this was something that was hidden in a lot of ways, but when it came to light, people wouldn't let go. It's so important that we get engaged, we get in, that we invest uh, in, in our futures because if we don't, if we cede that uh, to the powers that be, then we'll get run over. And Very so we got to avoid that. Very good. Terry Lambert, it's been a pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you, Ladies sir. Ladies and gentlemen, this is brought to you by the Cook County Bar Association being led by Yuri Clark. We look yeah. forward to him doing some great He's things. He's a great man. Former President Dardija Clark did an excellent, Pitts, excuse me, did an excellent job last Fantastic. year. We're looking through some great things. Stay tuned because this is really part one because we bring up Attorney Akbar. Yeah. yeah. A, a, a good attorney who's going to really take it from here in terms, of, in terms of what's next, in terms of how should the community act in terms of their interactions with the, with the Chicago Police Department. Again, this is brought to you courtesy of the Cook County Bar Association. We'll be back again next Monday, same time, same station. Thank you, Attorney Lambert. Thank you so Good much for having me. God bless you.